Well, the coming to want God to exist in your heart from a state of uh, that not being so is such a fantastic consequence that in gratitude which is still hard to express to a person that you haven't met in the flesh you transfer it to the messenger the teacher the evangelist and he becomes the epitome of what you're supposed to be hmm. you would think the messenger of God but no it turns out in the end you confuse his association with God to be so strong that you treat him as God. And because he's in the flesh and, a, and that's what you're used to dealing with, you transfer your allegiance, uh, wittingly or unwittingly, I think, to him. And this, by the grace of God, You've been protected by him in some way that not everyone seems to be so protected. That's my concern. So when I see that Paramahansa meets Babaji for the first time, it's after being exhaustingly desperate about wanting confirmation from God that to move from India to America was the way to go. What he had to do was right. He needed that confirmation. And, well, Babaji to him is the nearest to a personification of God. So he sees Babaji. Whether this is something that one's own mind can call from God, or whether it was Babaji, or whether God was willing to present him with confirmation in that language, so to speak, by which I don't mean Hindi, I mean specifically Babaji being present as symbolic of his param guru, you know, his guru, his guru, his guru, and so on. I don't know. Let me pause. Look, if I believe Paramhansa got everything right and understood it all. I'd be in danger of treating him as God. I assume he's fallible. Uh, that doesn't mean to say I want him to be. I hope to goodness that's not the case. But I don't want to make the mistake of worshipping the messenger. Hmm. Ramakrishna Paramhansa comes into my mind. Uh, yogi of some long time back now. I mean, earlier than Paramhansa Yogananda. Hindu priest. But one who earnestly studied a variety of different teachings and religions. Look, it's not understanding I seek. I try desperately not to seek understanding in a way. In case it collides with my devotion, my 
our devotion is to be. Our devotion is to be, not mine, to God, not to gurus and teachers. It's the great pitfall of so many religions, easy to fall into. It's encouraged by the unscrupulous and the unwary alike. Let's recast Paramahansa for a moment as an ambassador, spiritual ambassador of one religion and culture and age to another. Simplistically, to bring a particular practice, Kriya Yoga, to the West, to harmonize international relations by spiritual advancement in that way of the practice. A sort of religious, cultural, neutral practice that would bring a godly harmony. He wasn't sent to be worshipped, even if those that, well, those that sent him assumed from their cultural and religious perspective that he should be a guru and so forth. He was all but denied, effectively, forming communities, in spite of the fact he felt convinced this was the way ahead to protect people from a secularization that seemed to be endemic in Western society. Kriyananda, his retirement disciple, um, you know, he's only with Yogananda for the part, last uh, four years of Yogananda's life. Dare I say it, is really the only outstanding, notable disciple of Paramahansa. SRF seemed to have faded into a monastic obscurity and the Ananda organization is pioneering a religion that's joint Hindu and Christian rather than a practice meant to be trans-world. Specifically, a non-religious practice, Kriya Yoga. You see, strictly speaking, one is Lahiri gave it to anyone who earnestly requested it, whatever their religion was, and didn't require them to change religion, nor gave them religion instruction. You could say he gave them uh, spiritual instruction and instruction as regards the practice. But not deeply into the theology of Christianity, Hinduism or anything else. I'm tempted to say Babaji is the one instructing um, commentary on uh, the parallels between East and Western religion. But is that from Sri Yukteswar and therefore Paramahansa's view? 
You see, Paramahansa may be awe-inspired by his guru and so on, but not to the extent he's awe-inspired by the notion of Babaji. I want to say it's Lahiri that is the tangible linchpin of the whole line of gurus. He's referring back to Babaji and Kriya. It's Paramhansa who, via Guru, is referring back to Babaji and some unity of East and West religion that needs to take place. That's not the emphasis of Lahiri. Lahiri gives Kriya to those that request earnestly. They remain in their religion. He doesn't retrain them in some cosmopolitan international view. He just teaches them the technique. Is it the case then that Paramhansa was meant to bring the technique? If the technique yields the harmony, Paramhansa doesn't need to be worshipped. If it's a persuasive harmony between East and West, as in their religions be fundamentally the same and understood to be such, then he as a great teacher starts to be worshipped. I mean, look, this is not my own brilliant idea, so to speak. I mean, look at it in, in the Jesus story. You're not to call anyone teacher, Lord, Master. Nothing like that, you see. Why do you call me Master, says Jesus? You know, yes, I am, but I mean, if I, if, if I, or rather, if I am, why don't you do what I tell you? <laughs> I don't know if he was getting exasperated at that point. <laughs> in the story, in the story, you know. Why are you so repelled by religion, Marshall? Because it's got all this mumbo-jumbo that's nothing to do with loving God and seems to be such an enormous by-road and fascination and attraction and just not the point. I want to be devoted to God, person to person. What else can I love? Thank you, Heavenly Dad, for the Jesus story. If only we have eyes to see, ears to hear. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> Look, Lahiri is an accountant. I don't know, 20 or 25 years in the accountancy office, running it. There's a practice of accountancy that makes business and organization work. So he has a practice that makes life work. It's called Kriya Yoga. Anyone can do it. You don't have to be religious to run a big corporation. You just employ an accountant. <laughs> you practice accountancy. You know, you keep check of everything. You've got everything you can monitor and, and it's all decked out. It's methodical. It's progressive. It records everything. It you can trace everything. You can learn by it. So too with Kriya Yoga. It's a practice that helps you master spiritual maturity. It bypasses religion. Just as organizations bypassed 
spiritual vision and and theology and culture organizations simply bypass it and get done what is purposed to be done in the first place it's a practice accountancy Kriya Yoga <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying um, Lahiri was wrong any more than accountancy is wrong I think I am worried that a practice doesn't necessarily bring you devotion <laughs> that you can practice um, Kriya Yoga for years but without devotion you won't get to know God That may well be the experience of many of its practitioners. I don't mean I hope that's the case, for goodness sake, that would be awful. But I think it might well be. What's your solution then, Marshall, since you're so ably critical? Do you have anything better to put in its place? Yes, whatsoever's good and lovely, think on these things. Do you do that, Marshall? No, not really. Not effectively. I mean, in small ways, and I keep coming back to it, but not continuously. What I do do is when I'm confronted with great difficulty, I choose to thank God for it. That's more of a Link Others Prison to Praise approach. We thank God because we're assuming he's all-powerful and all-loving, therefore this difficulty is for a blessing. And to try and enter into that, I'm going to purposefully thank him for it, although I'm not appreciating its immediate benefits yet. I'm envisaging them. I'm trusting him for it. And that takes enormous amount of stress and worry out of a situation and may help me to visualize good instead of calamity. That may be very instrumental in what's going on as well. All the miracles that people receive under Carruthers, Merlin Carruthers' ministry in that way. I'm not saying that the practice is wrong. Cantancy isn't wrong. The organizations may be wrong in their purpose. The accountancy could be used by a charity to help to make it efficient and achieve its goals. Do you see the practice? Well, it isn't necessarily neutral. It could be negative, it could be positive, but I mean, it can be neutral. It can be used for good or it can be used for bad. It's your purpose that's going to count there. Is there a practice that's going to improve my purpose? And my answer is yes, I think so. The more you focus on that which is good, the more you can feel a trust. You feel a trust, an assurance of God. Your faith grows. And perhaps again, faith is the very essence of things that it's all about. If you can imagine for a moment God envisages something and he brings it to pass. He must have the confidence and the desire and the hope. Or he doesn't put together the vision in the first place. There's no hope, so he doesn't. I mean, hope is quite central. I mean, I find I've fortuitously, or by the grace of God, chosen the right name for a surname, hope. What brings hope? Not looking at the faults all the time, not the negativity of modern Western society. Hope comes from being preoccupied with that which is good and lovely, because you become assured of the existence of such and the benefit of such, and gratitude overflows you, and you want to express this to a loving God. 
And your only view of a loving God is a God who has your values, of course, not something contrary to them. That would be disastrous for you. So assuming you ascribe values that you appreciate personally to your God, you thank him and you grow closer to him. You're on the spiritual path. So the practice of being aware of all that's good and lovely is a great help. Could one still go wrong and miss the target? not love God as a consequence. Hmm. Not sure. Have to think more about that. Thank you, Dad. <laughs>